It is no secret that Sino-U.S. relations have quickly deteriorated in recent months. The State Department will impose visa restrictions on certain employees of the Chinese of Chinese technology companies like Huawei. We're looking at TikTok. We may be banning TikTok. Apps like TikTok, WeChat, and others. Closing additional embassies. It's China's fault. China. 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 These rhetoric and actions have reminded the world, in a worrying way, of a Cold War. In a time of uncertainty, does the world really need a new Cold War between the two largest economies? And we're not talking about just any relationship. This is the single most important, even potentially defining relationship of this period of history. This is a trade war that has significant implications for all countries and for all industries. The war is devastating. There will be no winner. And could the Sino-US relationship take another shape? Chapter 1, A Vaccine Race for All. As the world suffers from COVID-19, people are looking for the ultimate savior, vaccines. Right now, there are at least 150 vaccines being developed around the world. Both China and the US are in the leading position. Unfortunately, as the pandemic is being politicized and weaponized, so is the vaccine. We've got to get this vaccine done. Uh, unfortunately, we have evidence that communist China is trying to sabotage us uh, or slow it down. But isn't this a race that nobody can afford to lose? Even if the first vaccine is produced, the world must figure out a way to cooperate on manufacturing, transportation, and ensuring equality. The daunting process cannot spare the two countries' collaboration. It is, of course, understanding that at times of global crisis, you know, national leaders tend to focus on the needs of their populations. After all, that, in a sense, is what their job is, to worry about their, their national issues. But it, these, you know, science, as Richard has said and I have said, is global. Manufacturing is global. Um, the ability to deal with epidemics needs to be global. And so what we need is unprecedented collaboration across all countries. Chapter 2. The last thing the world economy needs. The world's economy has been hit hard by the current pandemic, and some predict this will be worse than the 2008 financial crisis. China's economy in the first quarter of this year suffered a 6.8% contraction due to strict pandemic control measures. The US's second quarter GDP was a record low of 32.9% contraction. As the pandemic rages on, talk of a decoupling or the end of the phase of one Sino-US trade agreement is only dimming hopes of a rebound. Bilateral trade relations are very important in a period of uh, economic crisis. Uh, as we learned from uh, more than uh, 100 years ago during the uh, Great Depression in the 1920s and 30s, mm -hmm. an important lesson, that crisis was so deep and prolonged precisely because countries, major economies, uh, rather than break down trade barriers, they re erected uh, uh, barriers. Reuters predicts that the global economy is expected to shrink 4% this year due to the pandemic, an increase on the 3.7% shrinkage predicted in June. The last thing the world economy needs right now is a worsening China-US trade relationship. Chapter 3. Burning the Bridge It is not only trade that is suffering. Trump's plan to bar Chinese students will cost U.S. universities 1.15 billion U.S. dollars in tuition revenue over the next 10 years. And it's not even just about the money. In July, Trump terminated the flagship Fulbright Exchange program in China, effectively ending a valuable people-to-people -people exchange channel between the two countries. The Trump administration may think of it as a penalty, but they are closing another door for the two countries to understand each other. 
the repercussions, although intangible now, could be disastrous in years to come. I think that's one of the things that uh, I think young, maybe younger people in both of our countries uh, do not fully appreciate. And that is how expensive our conflict, China and America's conflict, were in the 1950s and 60s. And we've had 40 years of peace, rapid economic growth. Both of our countries have improved. And the long and the short of it is, is that engagement for both of our people has been a tremendous success. Uh, it's had problems all along. It has serious problems now. I think the worst problem since 1972. But our younger people ought to appreciate what the costs of bad U.S.-China relations can be. And they can be enormous. Mutual understanding is the foundation of foreign policy. Perhaps China hawks in the U.S. need to relearn their history class. And perhaps the wisdom of Senator J. William Fulbright, who founded this program, on how to manage China-U.S. relations. The question is, is the U.S. ready to work with a country that is essentially different from itself to avoid the unbearable cost of a Cold War 2.0? Which side of history will the U.S. choose to stand on? Is the U.S. willing to write a chapter on cooperation rather than confrontation?